Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 23 of The Snapshot. We're your hosts. My name is Brendan Patrick, and I'm joined by none other than Marvel Snap Phenom Cam Bass. The Snapshot is a Marvel Snap podcast focused on the competitive side of the game. For episode 23, we're talking about a whole new world in Marvel Snap. We have ELO normalization, conquest mode coming out, and hell, maybe even move decks will be good in the next month. Let's get into it. Cam, your week in Marvel Snap, sir. I had full four hour streams of playing against all humans. I'm really interested to see what they do in the future, because what they did was they said, OK, if you're like in the top whatever percent, 10,000, we're just going to make it so you will never see a bot again. Uh, we are going to make it so 100 percent of the time, like the longer the queue goes, the more we will artificially drop your MMR. Not your actual MMR, but your matchmaking. Like in the matchmaking queue, the longer the queue goes, the the worse the person you're going to play is. But it's not a bot. And I got to tell you, I haven't struggled like that in so long. It's so weird without being fed free ranks. Not like I was unable to climb, but I wasn't positive with everything anymore. I like obviously I had some great success with Kitty Pride because again, the longer the queue goes, the more you get dropped. So like I'll play people just fucking around, and if you're just fucking around, you're not prepared for Kitty Pride. You die. I had some success with an electro deck on uh, the hot location, bunch of bunch of things that went well for me. And I think then I basically was like, all right, I'm not playing until the season's over. So I stopped there when the change started. I was at like. 273, I want to say, and I climbed about 17 ranks in eight hours, which is like that's that's slow. That's really slow. So I'm really like I'm, I'm kind of I'm dreading. The infinite climb tonight because either mm. it's going to be all bots and very easy or it's going to be very hard and i'm going to get tilted because i'm going to be playing spider gwen and it's not probably not going to be very good 17 ranks is a lot against only players that that's a lot of ranks uh um I mean, it was I, over the course of two streams yeah it's and still, like some non-stream time too yeah i guess actually it was short. one stream and then non-stream i was a lot of time yeah they did shorten the ranks too um I can't believe they finally did it, Cam. We've been talking about this for, I know. Uh, like, actually 22 episodes <laughs> up until now, and they, they finally did it. It's incredible. So they everything we talked about was just, like, expand the matchmaking parameter, get rid of the bots, and then just trickle down if you need to. And that's yep. that's absolutely the case. So this makes ladder playable in, in bot ELO and also gets... So the, the thing is, is that the rank... The rank um, the rank progression, so when everybody gets reset to 70 to, and then the climb to 100, it's probably still going to be asymmetric. You know, you'll have people that are going to have easier climbs than other people, but it's going to be way... That's what I'm wondering about. Like, did they actually make my climb harder? I think they might have made your climb harder. I think uh, they made my climb harder because what I'm seeing, this is this is the weird thing. I'm seeing all humans, all of them. Mm -hmm. I'm never seeing anything but. And yet I'll talk to people and they'll be like, yeah, I played like three bots from 99 to 100. It's like, wait a minute, does this change? Like, well, this is this a change that applies to my MMR mm -hmm. or to being post infinite mm -hmm. or to both? Am I going to be going through this when the infinite thing reset? I mean, I'll know the answer to that by the time this episode comes out. But mm -hmm. like, I, I, I don't know. I'll be pretty. I, I'll be honest. I like the free ranks before infinite. I don't like worrying about shit. Yeah. Like, I like those free ranks. I don't mind. Granted, there's still like a ton of free ranks, but. Dude, you know, I think there's going to be people listen to that and they be like, oh, uh, he's like, you like, I also I wanted the free yeah. ranks. I've been doing the non bot ELO infinite climb every single freaking month. And then every yeah, time I queue up, sucks. I hit a little snag, you know, I'm, I'm going a little bit slow and I go on Twitter and in 20 minutes, everybody's infinite. And I'm like, God damn it. Yes. <laughs> like, it's so frustrating. It sucks so bad. <laughs> yeah. Like, and it, you just want your rewards and then you want to go play the game. And then the future of, I think, playing the game for us is also now you can go play Conquest now. You, now you can go do whatever yeah. you want. Um, I'm just so happy they finally made that change. It's incredible. They're there are still some questions to be answered in regards to, you know, it obviously exists in post infinite um, in whatever X MMR bracket with the normalization. But they said it was about top 10K. Worldwide. 10K. Yeah. So as we get reset so worldwide, I don't even I mean, sorry, I keep interrupting you. I'm really excited about this. Right. Like I have a ton of thoughts and it's hard for me to get them all out. And I, I, I do. I do apologize for that. But like there's just like so much I don't know that I'm really excited to find out because either today I will get a free, easy, infinite. Because I'm doing my first ever 11 o'clock stream, which there's no point promoting it here because this will come out afterwards. But either I get a free, easy, infinite or I get a good video with good content with the new card. 
Mm -hmm. never had that opportunity before. I'm so happy. Yep. So, I mean, that's just, I'm just going to piggyback off what you said. The only question left. And like you said, when this podcast, com pod pa podcast comes out, it will have been answered, but it is mm -hmm. once we all get reset down to 70, does the ELO normalization still prevent you from facing bots or at least a copious amount of bots, right? Because even if they normalize your ELO and we'll say your ELO is uh, disgustingly high, say it was a million, they take it down to 800 K or something, but you could still be way above everybody else so when we're down rank 70 you could still see monobots to, to infinite that that could happen i got a i got a comment on my youtube channel mm -hmm. it was like there's no such thing as a top ranked snap player lol and it's like you know what that is true for literally everyone other than me i am the only person like not even in terms of high ranks but i am the only person who has ever had confirmed the number one mmr in the game mm. and that is not because i'm the best player but it, it is it remains true so far. I am the only person until they have a leaderboard. I'm the only person who has ever actually publicly been that. So while that may be true for everyone else, it is not true for your boy, the number one Marvel Snap player of all time until <laughs> proven wrong. You can't prove me wrong. I want to tangent off that and ask if they added a leaderboard Shoot. to ladder specifically, not conquest mode. Do you think you would find that to be an enjoyable experience as a competitive player or a stressful experience being a streamer? Do you feel like you would be you would you would feel the need to achieve a certain uh, rank on the leaderboard? Do you think it would be a good thing or I a think, bad thing? I think that really depends. I am trying to figure out what my content is, mm. right? And to what degree I need to be a high level player to be able to talk about this stuff. It's why I was so happy to have like people winning tournaments on my channel because I have a platform and they have credibility, right? And so my thought process is if I find myself in a position where I can't try hard for high ranks, which is it's eminently likely, right? I stream maybe five days a week. I try to have like actual break days. I don't play as much as someone like Revis, who is an absolute fucking killer, but also plays just way more than me. And that's just like how it is. I definitely don't play as much as do you remember the code deco guys? Like I could never, <laughs> ever do that. I couldn't do it. And like my my highest rank ever was 615. Those guys got to a thousand. Right. But it also broke them. They don't stream anymore. Right. Like They they stopped streaming because it was so unrewarding to farm artificial numbers off bots that's it and like that's the fate i look to avoid is burning myself out before I, I, the way i think about it is i think the people that watch my content would rather me keep producing it and for that reason i have to set limits on myself that's why this is like my first ever like super late night dj stream because i'm setting those limits because I artificially like like now now that I, there's actually something to do on day one, I will do it. But like I was specifically not playing day one because all it was going to be was the world's most depressing bot race against educated Collins. Mm. Love educated Collins, by the way. But like we've had games, we've had that race before where it's just like, all right, well, we're the only people we see. And then the rest is bots. So <laughs> that's yeah. now that that's over. There's actually something to do. You actually sort of point towards a very, um, an interesting conversation in whether a content creator like yourself should aspire to have competitive content that helps players or world class. And I would argue that competitive is always the way to go. And there's a huge difference mm -hmm. between competitive and world class. And I actually think that world class content for the most part doesn't exist. So in paper card games, there's a bit of a parallel. Like let's say a pro tour world is coming up. <clears throat> the best players in the world that expect to win that tournament are likely facing a very minus EV equation to give out the list that they will play to win the tournament. If they think they have a legitimate edge with the list. So it creates this paradigm where, you know, maybe the, like, the top end content is actually not like a, like a public commodity. Also, that's not sustainable whatsoever. If you are, if you are, if you're known for providing the absolute cutting edge, best content ever that this, you pick up this list, it is brand new. You will win. Like you can't do that tournament after tournament after tournament. It's just not a thing. It's not sustainable. So I think as there's a only one guy mm -hmm. I've ever known who's been able to do that, the top notch content, Jerry, top notch player. At the same Jerry time. Thompson. Yeah, it's Jerry. Yeah, it's Jerry. It is Jerry. Thompson. The only guy. Yeah, he really is the only like, one. That's and it. It's a tough, it's a tough model. So I think as a, as a, as a 
maybe former world-class player, now competitive player, you focus on increasing the production value of your content, increasing your audience, increasing your reach and the palatability of it, right? Because the thing is, is that your audience, 99% of them, the competitive content would benefit them. There's like a 1.1% or something like that, that the actual world class, they would get the list and they would go smash with it because right. you spent two months on it and they finally leaked it too, or you finally provided it to your audience. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. That actually just happened in Magic. Did it? Uh, Which, uh, a guy found like a super broken combo in March that was like broken on uh, Magic Gathering Online. Like it literally didn't work. Mm-hmm. And he tweeted about it. And then this, like like two or three days ago, that combo actually just started showing up in paper because they finally went to a paper event with it. And it's like that. It's crazy how something like that can stay hidden for that long. I guess it's easier in Magic where there's so many different game pieces with so many different abilities. But like it, it is, it is really remarkable how like once one thing happens, suddenly it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I mean, as far as my content, I'm not worried about being a bad player. That's not really the thing I'm worried about. I'm not even worried about not being elite. Like it's more just like when I have bad days, I feel bad, mm. and uh, I have to get used to having bad days. That's fine. I think I, to, I think it's a huge difference between trying to be a great player and trying to be the best player. Um, and I don't know if trying to be the best player is always is always the the correct path, you know, because that takes a yeah. lot, right? It's got to. I don't know if I'm ever going to not try. It's just, you know, sometimes it might not be doable. That's mm-hmm. fine. Like, <laughs> that's fine. Like, I, I understand that there are people who have more time to devote to be better at this game than I do. I understand that there are people who might be more naturally gifted at this game than I do. What I do well is I talk about it well, I explain it well, and I'm pretty damn good myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, Cam, let's head into the news because there's a lot this week. Obviously, we talked about ELO normalization. Let's go ahead and head into the other thing, which is conquest mode. It's finally coming out. (laughs) And I'm super excited. I have a feeling that you're excited as well, but I want to get your hot takes first how do you feel about the monetization system in conquest mode oh just off god people whining about that i'm sorry like I, I i i've noticed some people that i really like who are whining about that like oh it lets you pass the line who gives a shit you win five in a row i do not care like do you understand how hard it is to win five battle modes in a row there's that's that that's how it works on magic online they have leagues where you mm-hmm. have to go 5-0 you get your deck list published I don't care if you bypass the system. The system's only there to make it like so a free to play player has a reasonable shot. If you assume you have a 50 percent win rate in every game, you got like a one in 32, I think, assuming you're playing people at your uh, score or whatever of making it through that 5-0. If you accomplish that, that's an accomplishment. I don't care if you paid 500 gold or grinded the tickets over the course of the month. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the things I don't like about the mode is how time consuming it seems like it would be to grind the tickets over the course of a month. Maybe just like fire a couple shots in a month. See if you high roll. Like it's like an in client tournament. That's great. Yeah, that's phenomenal. I do not care that there is uh, on the ability to bypass it by spending gold like who that's every game, right? Like the fact that they're actually giving you a bunch of shots at a free entry is what's not normal in a tournament like this. Mm-hmm. normally you get one entry and sometimes you pay for it i think the convo would more come from the angle less about it this like this uh, this conversation that it's pay to win because you can buy i i don't i don't think there's any sort of foothold there um but there are probably people who you know knew this was coming out expected to come out and they probably they may have expected it to be free or they thought it should be free and it, it is free it, it is what am i free. missing about this well it's free ish right it's free ish. no it's free if you want to spend the time it's fucking free <laughs> like if <laughs> you want to if you want to grind like if you want to spend two weeks grinding the proving grounds it's free by the way hot tip for grinding the proving grounds both players should snap on turn one and that way you can figure out who's going to win very very early and then you can go back to playing more proving grounds keep that shit in mind uh yeah. that will that will help everybody we're gonna do proving grounds communism until they patch it yeah. <laughs> like, i'd say i i i definitely expected pretty much this exact monetization model and it, it's this not is better it, than i expected well it's not for nothing too because we do get rewards and they are yeah, pretty cool. It just kind of is for nothing. I mean, it depends, right? You it, you you can make the argument that the variants are it's just a cosmetic. Not. Yeah, but people buy cosmetics. I, I mean, I like cosmetics. Okay. I buy them sometimes. Okay, I'm not, like, saying, I'm not saying there's value. I'm not investing in cosmetics over here. I just like it, it's kind of nothing. 
I think if you want to pay 500 gold for a shot at a border on a cosmetic, I support your right to do that. <laughs> that's, that's, you also, you also get the Twitter out. clout when you fill up that bar with the five wins. That's that's, yeah. what, that's what you're really paying the 500 gold You get for. a good video. Like, that's what it's actually for, right? Is for, like, a content creator I 5 would with this. Mm-hmm. That's what it's for. Our deck lists finally have credence. Finally. <laughs> like, all these deck lists have been floating around on Twitter. It's just been like, oh, I'm playing this in infinite. It's like, infinite where? Infinite what collection level? What bot? Like, bot ELO, not bot ELO. Now it's like, I 5 would this conquest with it. It's like, okay. Uh, I'll tell you one thing I'm worried about, though. Mm-hmm. Legends of Runeterra recently has been having trouble with their in-client tournaments mm-hmm. uh, because those in-client tournaments use your ladder MMR to matchmake you. Yes. So there will be people. Uh, and I swear to God, if they do that in Conquest, I will never play the mode. I will also be... I will definitely talk about how shit that is. Um, one of my yeah. friends, uh, well, sort of like a... A mutual friend. Uh, I met him at the at the One Piece regional that was in Dallas recently, and that was a that was about how, Yoast. Yes, I'm talking about Yoast. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I we're, we 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 when when I played Runeterra, sorry for all the stuttering. When I played Runeterra, Yoast and Dresoth were on my like little testing team. It's freaking hilarious. Well, he <laughs> not the not the any str- strategy from his end, I don't believe, but definitely abusing that system. Where uh, you oh know, yeah, is, oh yeah, I, I that's how I know about the system. Yeah, like yeah. I am distinctly aware uh, of like like it would be like you'd, you'd you'd be in like silver and you'd see a dude with one champion in the deck, and it's like wait, what's going on here? And like like that if they bring that to conquest. I will never, ever play the mode, and I will devote all of my content to talking about why it's garbage mode. I, I, I refuse to believe they're stupid enough to do that, mm-hmm. but I also wouldn't think that Riot would be dumb enough to do that, so what do I know? Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see the the rationalization to do something like that. I think it would absolutely destroy the integrity of the mode, and it would be completely useless, but the the, <laughs> the rationalization would be, we don't want people to go 05. We don't want them to spend 500 gold and go 05 against some of the bet, you know, like... The well, Q- you wouldn't t- go 05, you'd go 01. Yeah, 01. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I mean, you, you literally can't go 05. Uh, but anyway, yeah. they don't want anybody to have those super feels bad. You know, back to back, maybe you buy four tickets and you just get smoked because you're you're bad at the game. And tough that, shit, competitive mode. And for, yeah, unfortunately, modern games just try to try to try to insulate you from the feeling of loss <laughs> nowadays. But um, look, if they do that, if they do that, it is it is DOA for me. Yeah, DOA for sure. Uh, I uh, I don't know what that means for anyone else, but if they if they do that, I will be quite upset at the mode if they if they implement something that mm-hmm. is a that abusable and b that dumb. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm gonna ask you a, an obvious question here because I just want to take it mm-hmm. take it back, zoom it out. What are your thoughts on conquest mode overall? Are you happy it's coming out? Oh yeah, you playing it. Is I mean, this is it this frustrating to me? They fix the bots right as they introduce conquest mode with the no bots. Now it's, it's like. You guys couldn't do this earlier. Like now I don't now I don't even have an incentive to play conquest. So I can just play a ladder. Shit. Uh, I will be wherever the eyeballs are. I know a lot of people are already like, oh, I'm going to pivot to conquest mode. I'm going to do that. And it's like, look, I'm not stupid. If that's not what people want to watch, I won't make it content for it. If that is what people want to watch, I will happily do it. But I do this. Because I like making things that people engage with. I like learning and growing as a content creator. And if I release like a YouTube video on Conquest Mode and it does super bad, and that's a consistent pattern, I'm probably going to go back to playing ladder. And I don't think that's impossible. Like, I actually think that's like likely to happen. Not that I'll never do Conquest content, but that I want what I make to be applicable to everyone. If you want to get better at Marvel Snap, I want you to come to my channel. I don't want you to feel like you have to understand battle mode dynamics to understand what I'm talking about. Much more likely that the vast majority of players are ladder and not battle mode in in the month or so. Maybe it's hot, you know, when it comes out, but in a month or so, uh, most people be playing ladder. I suspect that to be true, and like you know, I think there's some some validity to talking about cards in the context of conquest mode and the context of ladder. I don't think they're going to be super different, but like, for example, like if you're going to play Kitty Pride, you have to play a Kitty Pride deck that has the ability to beat wave if you're going to play it on in conquest mode. And you don't necessarily have to do that in ladder because you can just leave for one. But in conquest mode, that's the end of your run. So like there there are different dynamics, but I don't think they're going to be like super different because obviously 
if you enough people stop uh bringing the counters for kitty you just play the kitty and it's fine right like it they're 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 gonna be interesting metagame things happening in conquest mode mm-hmm. i think um i do want to i do want to shout out a take that i saw which was that right now tournaments are worthless and conquest mode will determine where the good players are and I, I, I believe this was like a bootman paraphrase of a Jeff Hoagland thing. And I just I want to shout it out because I think it's there's this thing that I think a lot of people on Snap Twitter do, which is they have the correct direction for an idea and then they go like two steps too far. And I think this is a good example of that where it's like, you know, it actually is a worthwhile point that the more rewards there are, the more integrated into the client these things are, the more available these kind of competitive events are the wider the player pool, the better the players. Uh, totally valid. But I think the idea that people like Lambie Series, Moyen, KJB, Educated Collins, people with proven tournament success in other games, and even myself to, like, I would say, a significantly lesser degree uh, in terms of tournament success or ladder success in other games, the idea that these people winning tournaments are somehow magically bad now, I think is, that's the step too far, right? Where it's like, Okay, yeah, you tell former Hearthstone Grandmaster Lambie series that he actually sucks because he didn't 5 0 a conquest, right? Like, mm-hmm. that just. I, tournaments are, it's a take that is tough, good. Man. It's a take that is good if it stopped at point A, which mm. is conquest is going to be great for the competitive scene because the more integrated <laughs> things there are, the better people get. But instead of stopping at point A, it continues to point B. And it's like, I just think that you kind of have to give these guys their flowers. Mm, yeah. Well, they're, <laughs> I, they're clearly Kawatech, good players, even too. Friend of the pod, Kawatech just won a tournament. Let's go. Yeah, he's won multiple tournaments. The thing yeah, about, he's been the, killing it. If you enter, it's this is going to be sort of a, a day gone by, I think, as Conquest Mode comes out. I think tournaments will be less popular. At least they won't. this situation will happen less. But prior to Conquest Mode... So. Prior to Conquest mode, tournaments in Marvel Snap are very hard to win. So I would I would look at players like Lambie Series, like Moyen. They are tried and true from other games. Educated Collins, mm-hmm. like they are good card players. You really cannot dispute that. If you enter you if you enter the correct tournaments in Marvel Snap, you will have to play or in in your tournament will be all of those players. Those those tournaments are yep. extremely hard to win. Not because they have to beat them. Not be, yeah. Not because they're hundred players hundred players big, but because. The best players in the game are in those tournaments, and those players are mm-hmm. incredible at card games. Conquest, on the other hand, I mean, you could have anybody in your in your in your sort of run up, and we don't even know how the leagues work, right? Like when you get to your fifth game, are you playing other people that are four zero? Are you playing new people? Who knows? But um, yeah, tournaments in Marvel Snap, at least prior to this coming out, it might still be that way in the future. Very very hard to win. I think these players are extremely good. Um, yeah, like right now, that's where all the psychos are. Yeah, they're, they're every grinding tournament these I enter, tournaments for like a hundred dollars. They're psychos. Yeah, they're like, just, they're just preparing. And the, honestly, the the thesis I think behind a lot of them playing those tournaments is just to prepare for the future. Like honestly, if you, if you look at these tournaments, um, you'll you'll see every single time you're signing up, KJB, Moyen, Lambi series, mm-hmm. Kabata. It's just like I mean, there's at least like. 10 killers in the entire tournament it's it, they're really really tough to win i think that they've been they've been great at least for establishing like the initial grassroots and competitive scene of marvel snap um but yeah i do think that conquest mode is going to be fantastic for sort of expanding the competitive side of the game uh for sure cam i gotta ask you content aside what mode do you personally prefer uh conquest slash battle mode or ladder i don't know i don't think i have enough experience really playing battle mode and i won't know until i I play it honestly i've enjoyed playing battle mode for testing i think that i'm actually very bad like i'm good at it's it's this thing that i've always had where when i'm watching someone else i know exactly what the correct play is and then when i play i uh choke i'm the boston celtics right Mm. like i i I, i'll like think myself out of what is a good snap right and i'm getting significantly better at that honestly i really am you can tell because more people are bming me and emoting snap when i like snap and lose but like that like we go back to the lambie series podcast where we talked about thanos right those Mm -hmm. principles of thanos are the principles of marvel snap that lambie's good at playing that deck because he's good not because thanos is necessarily the deck doesn't make him good he makes the deck good because he understands those principles and those are the things that I think are probably the weakest part of my game. The strongest part of my game is, you know, playing the cards because that's what carries over from other games. But I haven't played poker a lot. The weakest part of my game by far is outthinking myself and snapping. 
And that is absolutely actually probably the weakest part of my game is tilt management. <laughs> but, you know, those kind of go together. Uh, so ladder is usually really good to me because I can always just get another game and keep it moving. Right. So I don't know. Uh, but on the other hand, I think, you know, battle mode, there's going to be like a significantly larger way uh, weight to skill expression. And maybe I'll just find myself liking that more. I don't really know. Right now, there's no reason for me to play battle mode. There will be soon. Yeah, we'll find out. Uh, I uh, personally, I've it's it's tough to say because I think they're actually two different games. Uh, but I have enjoyed battle mode a lot because I guess I played it a lot less, so it feels fresh. It also feels much more personal. You get to play the player a lot more. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah, and it, that's when the poker aspect really comes out is when you start playing battle mode, uh, because you you actually get to read your opponent and you can play play off of their sort of psychology that you perceive early in the game. It's really fun because of that. Also, I just enjoy the the cat and mouse or the the back and forth of figuring out what cards are my opponent's deck as we progress right playing you know you play a different game plan in your game your game one and game two ish versus the later games when you know every single card in your opponent's hand and you sort of know their snap tendencies Correct. and i find that to be fascinating it, it really pushes the the whole snap mechanic a bit further where right now in ladder it it does it is it is interesting and unique, but it's a bit one-dimensional. Once you get to battle mode, it becomes very, very, very interesting. And that's where you see players like Lambie series snap in just wildly different ways. He talked about it on the podcast where, you know, often in closed deckless tournaments, game one, he will play out minimal cards just to try to get information on the opponent's hand. Uh, so just like taking a one cube loss to, to just get information. That's just something, of course, you would never see in ladder. So it, it adds it adds depth, and I don't know if it's depth in a good way, but it is definitely depth in an, in an interesting way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. All right, Cam, we got a new season coming out. Uh, <laughs> Ghost Spider. So I see we can't see it in the background, but I do think it's Ghost Spider Stan. It is written backwards. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, uh, it's, Cam, before it's not the, backwards, you're backwards. Yeah, Cam before the podcast was like, can you can you see this in the background? I was like. Yes, but it's backwards so this for people watching on video. I don't really know why it's backwards. For some reason, I think my Discord is mirrored and my OBS isn't. Mm. I don't. I don't know. This is how this works on OBS. I, I could have, I could Discord. have mirrored you two to be fair. So we're looking at each other. Oh, yeah. okay. Could have been me. Uh, anyway, Ghost Spider two three um, says on reveal the last card. Uh, on reveal the last card you play you played moves here. That's hilarious. There's a typo on uh, on Marvel Snap Zone, <laughs> and I caught it out of out of everybody. I caught the typo. Uh, Cam, that is that is that is that is impressive. <laughs> Let that percolate. Um, anyway, Let that percolate. Your thoughts? Your thoughts on Ghost Spider? Um, I want her to be good so bad. Holy! Oh my god! Oh my! I, I watched Spider Verse on Sunday. I love her. Uh, I want her to be good so bad. Here, here's the dynamics that I see for Ghost Spider. Basically, move move decks are not going to go bigger than Kitty Pride decks, so mm -hmm. there needs to be a secondary compelling reason to play them. To me, the most compelling reason I've found to play a move deck, and I think there's maybe two, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, the most compelling reason is that your wave turn is really awesome. You have wave plus cloak. You have wave plus Ghost Spider. You have a bunch of really awesome twos that can go with wave. And the reason this is good is because you get to be, think of it like a doom wave deck, right? Like you are going to be ahead and set up a situation where Heimdall is impossible to play around. And then you also have like a Dr. Doom or whatever, you know, like that is what I envision for it. The issue, I think, is in order to make that happen. You kind of need to draw all your cards in the right order. But the elevator pitch for move is it's Doom Wave, but your turn five with Wave is way better because you have all these ridiculously good twos. Like you actually do have access to some of the best scaling twos in the game Craven and Dagger. You have access to Ghost Spider and Cloak as enablers for those. So you play those early, you play Ghost Spider and Cloak late. You do something genuinely ridiculous. And as long as and there aren't very many decks that can actually pair a wave with something powerful mm -hmm. and pairing a wave with something powerful is really damn good. So there's that to keep in mind. There's also the fact that there are a lot of Spider-Man decks running around. 
And I would expect move decks to be pretty fucking decent into those played correctly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And those Spider-Man decks are really good. So then the question becomes, you know, obviously we can't outpoint send the kitty decks. So I think this is the only real pitch for this 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 card being good is in some sort of wave shell. Yeah. Yeah. You are gonna lose to Galactus though. <laughs> like maybe we put arrow in there and it's like fine. But otherwise you are hold to uh, Galactus. Yeah. Can you is there any room in this? I guess you would just play arrow, right? There's no way you would go the three slot yeah. you play Polaris or something. No, you can play Polaris, but yeah. like Arrow's a little better at yeah. it, right? Like a little, a little more consistent. You probably do like Polaris Miles because that's another good thing. Like again, the whole point is get ahead and move is decent at points. Honestly, yeah, it is. it's, it's like, a point slam deck at least. But most you have traditionally. to draw the right cards in the right order. So I would think uh, a lot of my original builds are going to have Chavez in it because mm-hmm. you want to be waving on five. You want to be playing like Dagger into. Uh, I don't know. You want to play like Iron Fist into Dagger or something, uh, or like you do all your setup and then play a cloak, that kind of stuff. And you just have a ton of options on the final turn. Yeah. Do you? Th- I'm gonna zoom ahead here because this card, at least, it was interesting to me. Spider Man 2099 four six. The first. Yeah, this one looks fucking good because the stats here's, are. Here's good. the problem, though. Did you know this? Uh, Did you know how he actually works? What is it? He only works once per game. Don't break my heart. Yeah. Well, it does say the first. Okay, so the first. No, time- no, no. They they confirmed this. The, he okay. only works once per game. Yeah. Well, the text says the first time this moves to a location, destroy the enemy card there. I mean. This as a 4-6 is pretty good. The fact that we used to play things like White Queen, I mean, I guess we don't need more, but I mean, this is, this is a pretty good no, card. 4-6 is like on-rate stats. The issue is like, you know, it's going to be a little more situational, but there's a lot of situations where this card is just like genuinely extremely powerful. Yes. Like against like the Lockjaw deck, this thing is either blowing up a Lockjaw or blowing up something enormous. And like my original pitch for the move deck before I realized that he only worked once uh, was you play him on four, you go ghost spider wave on five, you go Heimdall on six and you kill like a million things that that was my original pitch for like how he would be awesome. But he only works once. So that is, you know, a significant decrease to how he how I value him. Yeah, Uh, I I'm interested to see what he does. Yeah, so like, what are you? How are you moving this uh, consistently? Are you playing, playing something on three to move it? Are you playing something on, on five? Like what? There's like. I mean, you have you have you have your one cost and you have your three. I just think that like, yeah, I don't know. Here's my question: Does he work on face down stuff? I mean, shit, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. Yeah, it's like it's a weird question. Like, I mean, there's some interesting stuff there. Like, what can we do with a Zabu with with this as like a sub theme in Zabu? Right. Do mm. so you have Miles? You have this guy. Is there like a way we can make Zabu a thing? Can he go in like the Zabu Darkhawk Miles stuff? And how much support do you need for him? If so, I don't know. I'm interested to find that kind of stuff out. Yeah, I could. Do you feel like the Ghost Spider deck? Maybe like, uh, do you think that it could use a supporting card like Spider Man twenty ninety nine? Do you think that it would be unlocked by that, or do you think that Ghost Spider is potentially just good enough on its own? Is that what you're banking on? I don't. I don't exactly know. Like Spider Man twenty ninety nine is good in the context of you know your opponent having valuable targets to blow up. Yeah. If your opponent is playing like Squirrel Girls or whatever, he's not going to be that good, and. I do think Ghost Spider is like a super valuable tool for him, allowing you to get him where you want him to go. Uh, But like there's like a notable shutdown in the case of Cosmo. Like that's pretty hard to deal with. Like things like that are going to be hard to deal with. So I mean, like we talked about, you play Spider-Man 299 on four and then on five, you play Wave plus Ghost Spider and you're you're cooking. But yeah, Um Okay, I mean, I think I already know your thoughts on this, but what do you think about straight to series four? Good thing. I think it's awesome that they're putting cards straight into series four. Uh, I don't know how I feel about the flex drops outside of that. I'm interested to see what happens. My personal expectation is they end up 
uh putting like like not super delaying stuff in series five for so long but we're probably going to see more cards get delayed in series four rather than going to free would be would be my thought process i i don't know how many of them are but i i that that's sort of where what their previous change suggested to me i i do think they'd be pretty out of touch not to boot jeff down on time but maybe they have to test what leaving someone at 6k does right i think they might have to do that with jeff mm -hmm. just to get the information on like okay we kept him in there for an extra month what did that do to his sales what did it can we compare that to any other cards going like up that level going from five to four like yeah i wouldn't be shocked if they they trialed it that way i also uh eagerly anticipate communication on this because we are getting up close to series drop time aren't we right the patch mm -hmm. is coming soon and I think that one great way to avoid the dark hawk reaction is to let people know early. Yeah, true. Um, they also said, I mean, at least Ben Broad said, I'm sure it's been said in like a Discord somewhere as well, that you know, this change this is a change in card acquisition, technically. And they said there is more coming. So we are apparently progressing one way, shape, or form, whether it's good or bad, into a a different card acquisition system than we currently have, even with the new edition of direct to series four cards. So yeah, I, I don't know how much, uh, how much truth there or just honest integrity there is to the statement, whether they're actually trying to progress us towards like a card acquisition that benefits everyone better in sort of a mon a monetary way. But it, it seems like it's being stressed, at least to me. It was, it was literally in the seasonal video, which I, I found surprising. It was like, okay, we have more, we can't talk about it now, but you know, we're, we're, we're getting card acquisition better seems to be the pitch. I can't wait. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, really I'm... that's really all I've got to say about that is like, uh, yeah, you know what? I think card acquisition could use some improvement. Mm -hmm. I would love if things got better for people to acquire more cards. Mm -hmm. Until then, I am going to keep hoarding tokens because I am a psycho. <laughs> and luckily, straight to series four makes it easier to me to do that. So how many, I... how many tokens do you have? I've got about 12,000 tokens. I've also saved up like 25 boxes. Okay. And the boxes are probably going to open me a Series 4 card the second one of those straight to Series 4 releases. So uh, big, yeah. big brain, the big brain over here, because unfortunately, if they release those straight to Series 4 cards at the same time as they downgrade the other ones, I'm going to open like Howard or whatever. <laughs> but That's kind still, of it's, it's something. Cam, okay, um, so last week we talked about High Evo. We did talk about him a bit early when he first came out uh and then we, we were you, wrong as hell yeah I, I actually i actually sent you a message on discord like hey i want you to edit out the stuff i said about high evo because we recorded that on thursday and by like saturday i was like oh man this is like the best card in the game mm -hmm. and i don't even think he's overrated anymore that's just like that's the best that's the best card you can play right now i mean we'll we'll see how context changes him right mm -hmm. but right now he is in my opinion the core of like half of the viable decks in the form. Yeah, for the people that maybe haven't been playing or just you know don't have a lot of exposure to High Evo, can you expand a bit more on why the card is so good? Like, what is it doing that's unfair? Why is it existing in so many decks? Why is it you know so flexible across these different lists? Hulk. Mm. The reason is, and you'll notice this pattern in a lot of High Evo decks. I don't think a lot of people have picked up on it. But high, the good high Evo decks are built to win one lane with whatever it is you're doing and then win another lane with the Hulk. That's what they do. Hulk and Wasp. That, that's it, right? Those are the key cards in the list, right? Because, you know, Hulk in the Lockjaw decks gets up to like 20 power. And you look at like yeah. the good high Evo decks. High Evo Lockjaw, no Thanos, and high Evo Control. And both of those decks do the exact same thing. They just do it in different ways. They scam one lane for Lockjaw, uh, that is by playing Lockjaw or doing something stupid uh, with Thor and Jane and Odin or whatever. Or they scam a lane with Spider-Man or Storm, and then they win another lane with the Hulk. That's it. That's what they do. So mm -hmm. when you talk about like the reason this stuff is good, it's the soak stuff, not the loot cage stop stuff. The, the, the loot cage stop stuff is also like pretty damn strong, but there's nothing that can stop the soak. So when you look at like the power that these decks output while maintaining access to these control tools, these are absolutely haymaker control tools, Spider-Man, Storm, but they're still outputting a ton of power with Nebula, Sunspot, Misty Knight, sometimes She-Hulk, Actual Hulk, Doctor Doom, 
Like they have two six cost cards that are each going to be like six fifteen or sixteen minimum. Doom is a six fifteen. Hulk is usually bigger, and that is just the core of why these decks are good. Is that their final turns are better than your final turns, and if they can get ahead on one lane and just steal that one lane, they're gonna win another one with that thing. And the only real way to counter that is go insane on every lane, Kitty Pride. Or have something specifically built to counter them, like the Invisible Woman Killmonger version of Iron Patriot, which, like, you'd think that deck is good into a lockdown deck, but, like, it actually needs the extra help just because of how much power those decks output. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what it is. For the Lockjaw deck, like, you know, you have, like, Shang-Chi or whatever, and, like, Kitty Pride actually matches up really well into the Lockjaw deck because it just, there are more points. (laughs) Like the Lockjaw deck is cheating, but the Kitty Pride deck, like Kitty Pride hit monkey, you're going to like 20 something in every lane. That's just kind of how it's going to go when you play the Kitty Pride deck. And you you can even run like Iron Man in there and steal the lane they're invested in with the Lockjaw. Like the Lockjaw deck, my analogy is it's basically Shuri with instead of having a bad matchup into the uh, control Evo decks, it has a good matchup into the control Evo decks because it just runs like 50 large guys and can go bigger than them and can go across lanes with, you know, things like Dr. Doom and Thor's hammer and all that. Right. So it's actually able to contest those lanes really well while also having a Hulk that is honestly usually larger than the lockdown players Hulk. And that's kind of the key to beating it. But then that deck loses the good matchup against Kitty pride that the lockdown decks have because storm and Spider-Man are goaded against Kitty. Yeah. How would you, so would you just, the sort of pillars of the meta right now, um, the Lockjaw. High evolutionary high evol- and uh, high evolutionary. <laughs> and uh, uh, a little bit of Kitty Pride no, in there. Trying yeah, to compete. Kitty, it's Kitty. Yeah. Kitty. Kitty is the other one because Kitty is this sort of ever present lurking danger mm-hmm. where if you don't go bigger than it, you need to have an answer to it. Yep. Or you just need to accept that you're going to lose to it. And then Galactus, who is doing the same thing as Kitty, but from a completely different angle. Yeah. So do you feel like the, the Iron Lad Patriot list took a serious sort of, uh, it, it got knocked down no, no. a peg. No, so. it's still good. It's just, it, it honestly, that deck is still great. But <laughs> like, like I, I was talking to Moyen like two days ago and he was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm just favored into everything there. But it is a little bit hard to, in my opinion, like without building specifically for it, it's hard to cover every base, right? Because, and I think that's the thing that defines this format is it's very hard to cover every base. This is why the Darkhawk decks fell off the top of the win rate charts, because they used to cover every base. Yeah. The only bad matchup for the old Darkhawk Black Bolt stature deck was like beast stuff, right? And by the way, I got that confirmed. I, uh, Glenn finally confirmed that. I thought I was tripping. because They said there were no bad matchups on the, for that list, right? The Black Bolt stature thing. I was like, no way. The 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 Hitmonkey Beast deck absolutely ruined that deck. The She-Hulk won the What Am I list. Absolutely ruined it. And finally, I checked like a team answers, and he was like, ah, yes, the Beast deck was actually the only bad matchup for that deck. I was like, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it all along. I I I was right. But uh, yeah, like that that they no longer have no bad matchup. The decks with all the answers, the mid-range decks, no longer have no bad matchups because Kitty Pride means they have to run Wave. And if you run wave, you kind of have to be like, okay, how do I fit wave in here? And if you don't run wave, you lose to Kitty Pride. And if you don't run Polaris, you lose to Galactus. And if you don't run Enchantress, you lose to Iron Lad, except you don't even, you lose to Iron Lad Patriot, except you kind of lose to them anyway if they draw Invisible Woman. And there's just like, a, there's too many things. That, like, when I remember when I was talking about, I was worried about that deck being stretched then. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's happened. Yeah, which is a good it's thing. It's not like it's unplayable. It's just mm-hmm. like, it's no longer... When, the way I think about it is if your mid-range I have all the answers deck is no longer a deck that actually has all the answers, just play something proactive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I obviously talked about Kitty, but you know, if someone doesn't have Haivo, and <laughs> I'm assuming if they don't have Haivo, they don't have the Galactus deck because that's an expensive deck. I mean, how are people sure. competing? Do you feel like you need Haivo to compete in this meta? I think for the last two weeks, you've had a pretty high, heavy advantage if you had the card. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think you need high Evo to compete in this meta. I do think it is generally, uh, the strongest thing to do. But I mean, like when you think about a lockdown deck, right? Doesn't that deck just kind of eat it to move? Maybe, maybe not. We'll find out. Like 
the good thing about metas is they change all the time. All the time, especially and, in Snap. <laughs> yeah. And so I do think that high Evo, like, dude, this card was a 4 7. I know. They what took in a, the world? Oh, uh, they massacred my boy. It's already like the best card in the game. <laughs> I mean, 4 7, it would have been a free roll, dude. <laughs> a free roll. It already is. <laughs> it's already like, if you, like, I, I did this thing where I went on Untapped and just looked at all the most winning decks. Mm-hmm. And it's just like like every single one of them until you get down to like the twentieth is high evolutionary, and it's just like like that like that's how it is like that's not how it's always going to be, but that's how it is right now. Who knows what changes about that? Because right now I think you know there are two shells that high evolutionary excels in, and both of them kind of do the same thing from different angles, like we talked about already. And if at some point the metagame starts moving again, then those won't be the best things to do all the time. Mm-hmm. If a bunch of move decks are around, it's probably not a good idea to be playing Storm. You know? That's not a very good matchup. I, uh, someone challenged me on a, on a stream, by the way, and I played a lockdown deck into their move deck. They were deemed like the best uh, the, the battle mode thing. I ended up winning it, but like it required a lot. <laughs> it required like I had to make a very hard read for four cubes or there was no shot. I was even Mm. in the battle. Like it was not a good. So do you expect this met this meta to shift with the addition of ghost spider? Or do you think we're looking at like a, an OTA or even a patch to sort of knock high Evo down a a peg? And I don't mean nerf high view, by the way, they it's OTAs patches. They can also be buffing other things. Of course. Honestly, I have no idea. I'll tell I'll tell you I'll tell you what what that'll depend on is just how many people are willing to experiment with Ghost Spider. Mm-hmm. Cause I do think it pushes you away from like wanting to be a storm deck, because then you end up having to storm like the right lane or whatever. But like you storming that lane is is genuinely like it, it's a good play. It's your best play. And you have Professor X too, to like lock down the middle. But like you need a lot to go right, I feel like. And I, I don't know. I think maybe I'm overstating how good the move deck is, because like I said, I did win the battle mode, right? It, it It is still, like, really good to be able to play cards like Storm and Professor X. High Evolutionary is still really damn strong. But I do think, you know, if enough people play around with Ghost Spider, it, it might get a little more hostile. Hmm. Mm. Are there, are there any uh, so there's two more cards coming out this month as well that we didn't talk about mm-hmm. silk and silk and spider ham are they worth mentioning is there anything like are they peaking your silk interest is at all? i think okay so silk series five uh two five good stats uh says after any card is played here this moves to another location i mean it's good at, it's, at, it's decent because two five body is pretty strong eh? well I, mean, I think it's also decent because like okay it's turn six and yeah, you need a card to get into a closed off location. Yeah. It's turn six and they stormed you. Like, fill up a lane, silk it over, right? Like, that's, that's, that's a pretty powerful ability. And it's like, you get to choose it too, right? Like, basically, the way I think of silk is it gives a Sarah deck an extra tool. That, I was, yeah, okay. I was like, literally saying, I was like, okay, are we playing this in Sarah? <laughs> Yeah, like it gives a Sarah deck an extra tool. Now it's A, it's just a 2-5. That's ridiculous. And B, you can just like yeet it elsewhere. And C, if you're willing to just yeet it everywhere, you can just get a cheap Miles Morales and suddenly you're playing a 2-5 and a 1-5. And it's like, if you're backing that stuff up with strong interaction, you're kind of cooking with something. Yeah. Strong interaction is the key because I mean we talk we talk about two five one five. This is, I mean that's exciting, but with these Kitty Pride decks running around like those, right? You're not going to beat them on power. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. But can go you, into like a Sarah tech with shell. Yeah, like the Sarah. Yeah, you, Sarah can, you tech can fit decks. it in there. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it looks pretty good. All right, Cam. Anything else you want to mention as we head into the new season here with Conquest mode? I mean, we we got all, it's kind of like. Christmas morning this season. We got everything we wanted kind of at the same time, right? We're going to find new, out. <laughs> new interest of move. Like, is move going to be an archetype? We have conquest mode coming in. They freaking fixed ladder. Like, what? They did it. I never thought it would happen. Um, but anyway, you're going to be streaming. Like you said, this, your stream will yes. have happened by the time this releases. Sorry, we released late this week. I unfortunately was a bit ill earlier, but. What sort of what uh, what is your plan? Are you rushing infinite and doing conquest or like what what sort of this strategy for Cam? It's going to depend on how many bots there are. Okay, 
if I get a free infinite on day one, that's cool. If mm. I don't and I get to make content on Ghost Spider, also cool. Uh, I don't know how much I'm going to put effort into infinite anymore, given conquest coming out. Right. Like, again, I'll just have to play it by ear. I don't have a concrete plan. I know. I think a lot of content creators are much more. <laughs> I'm not going to say a lot of people treat it more like a job than me because mm. I treat it like, look. I can't enforce my will on reality. Whatever happens will happen. I'm not going to force myself into playing a bunch of conquest unless that's something I really enjoy and something people want to see. And I guess my ethos for streaming is I do the stuff I like doing. It's why I don't do deck requests or whatever, right? Like, I'll review your deck, but I won't play your deck because if I wanted to play your deck, I'd be doing it. Hmm. I play the shit I want to play because that's what I want to do. And that's why I stream is because I want to do this. and I'm going to broadcast it. And so that ethos is going to be the same. Yeah, uh, I will be doing the same thing I always do, which is whatever the fuck I want. Yeah, it's not it's not really an ethos for streaming or snaps, just an ethos for life right there. Just do what you want to do. Um, I do want to mention to anybody listening right now, uh, if you, if you're, if you're sort of new to conquest mode, you know, this new mode's coming out, you, you want to be able to get your infinite border or whatever on your avatar. Uh, I really do recommend you go back and listen to the, the podcast we did with Lambie on Thanos. I know it says Thanos masterclass, but we really dive into a lot of the intricacies around conquest mode. Specifically, we were talking about tournaments, but this is effectively the same thing. Talking about some of the strategies of snapping, um, sort of reading your opponent's deck playing your opponent, etc. Highly recommend you go check it out because Conquest Mode, it, you are playing Marvel Snap, but it really is a different ball game. Um and you'll get used to it. It's 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 not that hard, but yeah, definitely some good some good tips there from from Lambie series. Um Cam, anything else before we, we close out for the week? Uh reviews and stuff? We did have a very nice review. Uh, but I will oh, read wow. it I will read it next week because I my phone is dead. Uh, my phone is oh, dead. Oh my god God. <laughs> yep, and it is not in my hand. But it came in on email, and it was extremely nice. It's actually very long. I, I, I remember I was reading it in like the airport or something. Like this. But I'm happy you brought that up because if you if you're listening to the podcast and you enjoy listening to us every week and you want to help us out, the number one thing you can do is leave us a review. Um, you got to rate this podcast dot com slash the snapshot. Um, for those listening on audio platforms, is a video version of this on YouTube at youtube dot com slash the underscore snapshot. Cam and I are both on Twitter. My Cam, I'm not a Cam Best and Mess. That's him. He's a Cam Best. That and is mess. me. I'm at Brendan APG, and Cam is streaming. Cam, you said you have an 11 p.m. stream tonight. I know we said it already happened, but what's the schedule yeah. outside of that? Uh, Tuesday and then Wednesday and then Friday and then Saturday Sunday. Hopefully. Until I get, unless I get too tilted and just like tilt off the face of the planet. We'll see. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much for listening this week. Enjoy the whole new world of Marvel Snap. A lot has changed, and I genuinely think it's for the better. See y'all.